to everybody. Thanks so much for listening to our uh, podcast. And also, if you're listening to us on any other platform, we know there's quite a few of them, along with, uh, you know, the radio, of course. We thank you for so much. Uh, so, I, again, if you're listening to us on YouTube, because we're really trying to build that up, all the numbers on the other platforms have been good, uh, please go to www.youtube.com slash firebreathingrob. I assume if you're listening to this, you're probably already there. But definitely click the subscribe button, share this video, like this video, and get this out to many people. This is going to be a real good interview, and it's something that's needed right now, especially in this country, but all around the world. We're going to be talking appropriate. We have a special guest today, the Reverend Dr. David Chodka, and he has a new book out, which if you go on Amazon, it is number one in sales in the prayer category as of this past Thursday. So he's really kicking butt and it's really good. I have the book on the ebook too. So I appreciate you, Dr. Chaka, for coming on. It's really been a pleasure getting to know you so far. And we've only talked for a little bit, but I'm looking forward to hear more about you in sure. prayer in general throughout the interview. Okay. So how do you want to start? <laughs> all right, yeah, well, we got a lot to top off. So first of all, you know, we have... And I, I want to get into this before we get into the book, because I do want to, you have a great story, and I do want to tell you a side of the story. But, you know, as this show targets millennials, this is a problem that I see, even for a person like me, I'll be honest about this. I grew up Catholic. I went to Catholic school from K through 12. And then I went to a school that was a college that wasn't Catholic, but they did have a Catholic church. But we're seeing droves of millennials leave the church. Uh, you know, whatever religion they are, it doesn't have to be Catholic, but there's people that are really becoming agnostic, atheist in this country, but around the world. Why do you feel that is? Well, I can tell you, there's a, there's a crisis happening right now in my country here in Canada. Sure. Uh, we had residential schools and basically it's genocide to Native Indians. It was terrible. They've just uncovered 700 and change graves in one location. There was 250 graves in another location of children that went missing after they were taken from their parents. Awful stuff, uh, racist, hateful. And so, I mean, the, re the reality is the message of Jesus is love and the practice of the church has been anything but. <laughs> so now you know this and I know this. And I don't think, I don't know, I don't know anybody who will tell me they're perfect nobody's perfect everybody blows it everybody drops the standard everybody even you even dis disappoint yourself you have you make a decision to get up in the morning and you do the wrong things it's one thing to take a trip and stumble and then get yourself up and dust yourself off and say well that was a bad idea it's another to be involved in policies that go over generations and that are wrong and wrong-headed and inappropriate and wrong but the, i think behind this once we get past the injustices and that by the way there are injustices for governments, there are injustices for people groups, there are injustices for every race and nation across the face of planet Earth. Genocide has been practiced by every kind of people group and every kind of color across the planet. The issue is it grates with the message. Mm -hmm. And nobody likes hypocrisy. People detest hypocrisy. And if, if what you believe is not what you live, then people will say, I'm not going to trust your church, I'm not going to trust your faith. And so the other thing that's behind this is uh, there hasn't been what I call a dynamic engagement with the real power of God. And uh, that's what this book is about. And actually, it's quite funny the way that it started, this, the way this book began. Uh, it was my encounter with the power of God that led me uh, into writing this book. But it has entirely to do with the fact that there's a, there's a God above who, has, who, who loves the human race, who came in, in the person of Jesus, died for us, rose again from the dead, so that we could receive his grace, receive his power, receive his love, and live it. And churches haven't been doing that. So I mean, I thought that's, that's an answer for you, or if that's just the beginning of the conversation. Well, it's obviously the beginning of the conversation, because we got a lot, <laughs> like I said, to talk about you and the book in general. Uh, so David, my thing is, is I see this through people I know, uh, people that are even in my family, they may have had a, ch a child that died, they may have some kind of, uh, you know, uncurable illness. And they may have been really close to God, you know, previously in their own lives. And then all this tragedy hit my head at once or I may just, you know, hit, you know, in small steps as we travel on this road, which we call life. With that said, you know, they kind of go away from God. So what would you say to them when somebody says, you know, I've had so many heartaches in my life. You know, why would a, you know, good 
you know, great God that we, you know, we worship every day, want this to happen to me and people all around the world? Well, you want a fast answer? <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you, uh, let me, let me speak as honestly as I can. Sure. I have a daughter with muscular dystrophy. Mm -hmm. I have a healing story from my wife and my son, but not a healing story for my daughter. Right. My father uh, was Eastern Orthodox. My mom was Catholic. Okay, so that's the background here with this one. Sure. When my dad was a little boy of six, he was kicked by a horse, lost most of his vision, and went through life almost blind. Wow. So brilliant guy. Actually, he was very bright, but the, the handicap with his eyes prevented him from learning. And so this was back in the 19, you know, 30s and 40s when, you know, right. medicine was pretty rudimentary. But uh, here's, there, there's this thing called holy mystery. And the reality is we live in a world that's fallen. And I don't know anybody who will claim that they're sinless perfection unless they're locked in some mental ward. <laughs> <laughs> I resigned from being Messiah about two weeks in. <laughs> so I don't want the role. I don't think it's a good idea for me to have the role. And the thing, I, I don't want to, listen, I have four earned degrees. So yeah. I believe in learning. I believe in education. But I have three pounds of gray matter. And this three pounds cannot wrap itself around the mystery of suffering and glory that are married together in this thing called faith. And every kind of faith on the face of planet Earth has to grapple with the fact that we believe in some kind of a deity that's filled with love and grace, and we have this reality that's filled with pain and sorrow. Right. And so what you have in Christianity is that God himself entered into it and participated in it and then suffered in the middle of that, and he allowed himself to go through something as alien to God as death. All he was rejected and beat up and then crucified on a cross, and then it was horrible. It was actually there in order to suck up all the poison so that we would have a hope for this, this thing called healing prayer, which is medicine to the soul, as well as to the spirit and to the body. Now, if you want to talk, have a conversation with me about the, the relationship between suffering and faith, that's a three-hour conversation on a, on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we don't have that much today, but nope. I do want to get into the book. So can you talk about how you got started in the prayer for healing? Well... This, this, this is par a partial answer to your first question as well as an answer to the one you just asked. Okay. Because for me, if God is not alive, there's no point. Right. If, if there's no power of God, there's no presence of God. So what's the big deal? We better just all go off and die somewhere. Because <laughs> that's not going to do us any good. Now, here's, here's the reality. So when I first became a, a Christian believer, and I, I became one by choice when I was 16 years of age, because my dad struggled with believing. Very mm -hmm. same thing in this problem of suffering. My mother was kind of a nominal Catholic, and she didn't know what to do with my dad, who was wounded and hurting, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I came to faith, I was the first in my family. But I came to faith because I encountered him. And But, but I, what I didn't do is I never met anybody who was ever healed. And I didn't know anybody who, except these crazy guys on television, they'd slap okay. you in the forehead and scream, and they'd wave little white pinkies in the air, and <laughs> they'd make strange little sounds. And, they, and it, it was not a good model. <laughs> So here's what, what happened to me. I was eight years in and I was training for the ministry because I really did believe that my God was alive. And there's stories that I could tell you around that, including how my father with his pain encountered mm -hmm. faith in the Lord. But let me focus in on what's going on with this one. So I was studying for the ministry and there was this guy in my class who just, he, he kind of liked the idea of God is love, but didn't believe in this miraculous stuff. Mm -hmm. So if I in seminary class would say, oh, by the way, that that historical event in the scripture, that's that's for today, I would be made a laughingstock. He would poke fun at me. He was a great comedian. He was much better than me. <laughs> <laughs> at any rate, I, it, you, can, you can put up with that five or six times and you, you just avoid the guy. Mm -hmm. And so here's what happened to me. I was bopping around, doing my, my assignments, getting my homework done. And a mutual friend of ours, a young lady, uh, I will call her Susan. I call her Susie in the book because I haven't got her permission to tell the story. But right. she walked up to me one day and she said, you know, our friend's in the hospital. And I didn't feel very bad. <laughs> 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 I said, oh. <laughs> I said, but then, of course, you know, reality kicks in and you realize this is serious. Yeah. And said, Sorry, what's up? He said, well, he has phlebitis. He's, he's, got a, he's got inflammation in his arm. There's an embolism in his vein. Yeah. And if that thing breaks free and gets into his lung or his brain, it'll kill him. He's 27, wow. he's married, he wants you to come and pray with him. And I looked at the girl and I said, you gotta be kidding me. This is the guy who made fun every time I was in class, every single time I was in class. 
If mm -hmm. I said, oh, by the way, Jesus healed a leper, you know, I'd, I'd be making fun of him. If, if I said, you know, Jesus died on the cross for us, he'd make fun of me. Right? And this, go, this had gone on for quite a long time. And I looked at her and I said, I don't know if I can believe it. And she said, well, you know what? He's been cruel. I'll go talk to him. I said, okay, I got it. It's not, not going to go there if, if it's going to be, a, I figure he's going to make fun of me and make me a laughing stock. So she goes into the hospital, sees me the next day in the coffee lounge in the school. And she said, oh, he's terribly sorry. Uh, he he does he didn't mean to do that to you. I said, "What do you mean? Didn't mean to do that?" <laughs> <laughs> I didn't believe her. I said, well, he wants you to come, so I didn't go the second time. And the third time, I saw her in a plaza as I was going to a class, and she looked at me and said, "You didn't go." I said, "I'm not going." And she got really mad. Oh. And this this was a friend, and she knew my middle initial, and she stomped her foot, and she said, "David R. Chaka, don't you believe the Bible is the word of God, and it's to be obeyed?" I said, uh, yes. She said, what about this scripture? I was sick and you visited me. And suddenly a fell blow landed in the center of my soul. Oh, no. I thought, oh, no, no, no. I don't know how to do this. And this guy who's made fun of me wants me to go and pray for him. And I had these two fears. One, I'd never seen any kind of healing. And not, I, not, so I don't I know how to do it. Number two, uh, I didn't know if the guy was going to make fun of me. But the scripture was clear. So I went, I go in the hospital room, all these bottles, all these tubes, all these monitors, all these wires attached to this guy's body. And I looked at him and I said, listen, I just have to get one thing clear. Why, why do you want me to come and pray for you? And he said, I am so sorry I treated you poorly. And he was obviously moved as he said it. And then he said, you're the only guy I know who believes the book is actually true. He's talking about the Bible. Yeah. Okay. And so he said, you're the only one I know who believes the Bible is true. I don't want to die. I could die. Won't you please pray for me? Well, what are you going to do with that? So, I mean, yeah. So I walked over to the side of his bed. And of course, I had no, I had not a sweet clue about what I was <laughs> what, what am I going to do. There had been no training at seminary about how to do prayer for you, except these crazies on TV. So I walked over and I said, where, and I remember in the Bible, Jesus placed his hands on people. And so I thought, okay, maybe I'm supposed to do that. So I, I said, what, where is the, where's the affliction? He said, left arm, just over my elbow. So I put my hand there. And Robert, you got to know, I prayed a prayer. I have no idea what I prayed. <laughs> it was an honest prayer. It was, I'm sure it was a faithful Christian prayer. And I said something to the effect of, oh God, this man's in trouble. Yeah. Would you have mercy on him? Would you touch him? Would you heal him? And as I prayed, the most amazing thing happened. It was like the room filled with power. The whole room. He felt it and I felt it. And then inside my heart, I felt this fiery compassion combined with peace and warmth enter into my whole being. And it rose up and it filled my whole consciousness. And then I felt this fire go down my hand and into his arm. And then he, he looked at me and he said, what was that fiery presence? Mm. And I, I said this without being really sure. I said, I believe that's the Holy Spirit of God touching your body. And then I ran out of the room because I was afraid that nothing had happened. <laughs> As I ran out, the nurse ran in. This is, this is a completely true story. The nurse ran in, was walking in, and he said, I can go now. My friend from Bible school came and prayed for me. I can go now. <laughs> and the nurse said... We're not going to let you go unless you run some tests. And so they ran a battery of tests because he was slated for them anyway. Mm. All the phlebitis was gone from his body. All of it. Wow. That's and, insane. Well, <laughs> well, let me tell you what happened the next day. So I see the next day he's in the coffee lounge at the school. And remember, this is the school where he made fun of me with all my peers. Yeah. So there's about, you know, and so <laughs> we're in the coffee lounge and there's all these peers. And he, it was a 19th century stone building with fluted, you know, but, fl abutments in the hallway. So mm. he, he pulled me into one of these corners <laughs> and he looked around in all directions. And then he said, that prayer changed my life. And what he, what he didn't know was that prayer changed my life. Yeah. I had never seen it before. I'd never known that it was 21st, 20, in those days, it was late 20th century. I didn't know it was 20th, 21st century reality. I didn't know that God could do that through a human vessel. Right. And so it began to search for me. I started to research the scriptures and I began to read widely on this topic. 
And over the course of years, many, many, many different people have experienced miraculous healing. In fact, just, just yesterday, I went to visit a fella who had had, he was in his 70s and he had a terrible fall. And um, he had uh, torn all of the tendons in his leg and he erected it so that he could not actually get out of bed without excruciating pain. And uh, I went to see him like a week ago and it was just about 25 minutes before his physio was supposed to get there. So I, I was under a bit of a time crunch because you don't want to stop mm -hmm. the professionals doing their job. And so he said to me, would you pray for me? I said, well, let's do it. So I put my hand on him. And again, it's the same, it's, this is the same thing that happened. I, I would become conscious of the presence of God. The, the, the presence would grow rich inside me. And the only way I can describe it is it's like a velvety smooth assurance of warmth in behind my emotional state that drives me toward faith in the Lord and compassion toward a person. And it's in combination. You're aware of God and you're aware of the person in trouble. And even if you don't like them, if you don't know them, or if, you're, if they've done something to push your buttons or whatever, you feel this rising wave of compassion flow through you. I put my hand on his, on his kneecap because the, I didn't want to put it around his groin area. That's just out of reach, out of bounds. Right. <laughs> so I started to pray. And once again, that same experience of fire and peace entered me, went into his body. All his pain vanished. That was a week ago. And so my wife and I went to see him uh, just yesterday because we wanted to see how I was doing. He's walking. He's yeah. moving around. His, he said he was on Percocet. I mean, he was on heavy-duty painkiller. Yeah. And the, the physio came five minutes after I left and examined him and said, what happened to you? you, you, all, you you've made like substantial progress here. This is ridiculous. Can you stand up? And the guy stood up and he had no pain. And he was no longer even on an Advil or a Tylenol, nothing. He didn't have to have any painkillers and he's been off Percocet for a week. And that's a major thing. You know that yeah. that's, right? That's, that stuff right. is dangerous. You have to be careful when you do that kind of medical painkilling. Right. You can get hooked on prescription meds and it's not. Oh, a yeah. Anyway, he, he, he got off of it the day that we had the prayer time and he's walking and he's, he's not 100%, but he had like a 75, 80% improvement. And his, his physio said, I just said, I just can't believe this. I saw you yesterday and you're now like that. What happened to you? And he said, well, the pastor prayed. He said, oh yeah, what else happened to you? <laughs> <laughs> there, there's this unbelief toward the power of God in our culture. Yeah. American culture, Canadian culture. Now, strangely, you got this crazy stuff about the occult rising. See? And, and you, you, have this, you have this belief in the unclean th stuff, but you're not having this conviction of the clean stuff. Because the church has besmirched the reputation of God's glorious goodness and his name. Yeah. And you know it. I don't, you know, I don't have to pursue No, it. I agree. I, I think, you know, even myself, you know, I, I was raised Catholic, like I said, and I went K through 12 to Catholic school. We, we didn't normally study Christianity. We studied um, Judaism, uh, Islam, too, uh, you know, because that's what we had to study in school. But I see that now as a person... You know, I'm I'm upset. Everything I hear about the Catholic faith, you know, that they, you know, all that money is going to paying off uh, sexual abuse cases, and it, yeah. it's really sad. It's a disaster, yeah. and that's why a lot of people, uh, you know, don't go to the church. A lot of people lose faith in these things. You hear these things on TV, like you said, the people that are hitting the guys in in the head, and then they get up and they say, "I can walk again," and. Those people, a lot of those guys are scam artists. They're stealing money from people. So when you have, like you said, all, I'll, I'll, um, let me just finish this and because I, I do want to hear what you have to say about that. When you have all this stuff that's going on in culture, whether it's American, Canadian, European, whatever it may be, of people, you know, screwing, you know, screwing people, uh, hurting kids, uh, that, you know, people lose faith and they just go away from it and they go into really bad things whether it's drugs uh pornography there's all sorts of things like you said it's heavy addicting stuff and it really hurts the mind and ends up killing people well now we have to be careful here because here's the reality yeah. every christian on earth happens to be a human <laughs> yeah, no, i hate it. <laughs> that's true and so well, you know humans do crazy things i don't know if you ever noticed that <laughs> they sin <laughs> so that was my first experience I went, my first church is in northeast alberta a little tiny town right. and i went there with my hopes high in the air and you know what there was sin there <laughs> there was sin there too yeah. everywhere i went i found broken fallen people right the issue is not the fact that we're broken and fallen 
The issue is the fact that we are living with hypocrisy and not owning the fact that we're broken and falling and trying to pretend we're something that we're not. I guess what I was trying to uh, get at, Dr. Chodka, is that when people look to these people that are reverends, that the uh, fathers, priests, whatever you want to call them, they look to somebody that's a leadership symbol, a symbol of authority, a symbol of a person that is going to do right things. I agree with you. There's sin in everybody. Everybody's going to make a bad decision. But when you make those huge bad decisions, like what's going on in the Catholic faith right now, and it's been going on for years upon years on end, as far as the sexual abuse scandals, then, you know, people put trust in those people. People let their kids be altar boys for these people because they trusted, they believed that this person did good. And then, uh, you know, behind these people's backs... They're touching and grabbing the kids and having sex with the kids. So that's where I guess I was going with that is that, you know, when you have that kind of authority, when you're leaving, leading hundreds or even thousands of people in a, in a pastor, as a pastor rather, in a church, and then all this crazy stuff goes on, it's, it's people lose faith, I guess. No, listen, you don't have to persuade me. I've had to remove two associates for adultery. Yeah. And it's terrible but when it happens and it's a pastor or it's a Christian leader of any kind. And right. Because the gospel says God is love, God is truth, God is righteous, God is pure. And the leaders of people who are, are supposed to be teaching that by example. Yeah. In fact, scripture does, does not say teaching is imparting information. Scripture says teaching is modeling truth. Right. That's what teaching is in scripture. And if you don't model that truth, you at least have to be honest enough to say, you know what? I have blown it in this area. God forgive me. And have an accountability group so that you can talk to each other. I do want to go back into the interview and the book in general, but last question on this stuff as far as Catholicism and other religions. Well, but mainly, so you should need to be careful. <laughs> say again. I'm not. Real, I had I had a funny. I stood next to John Paul once at a. Oh pope. wow! I did. I, it was because I was mistaken for a Franciscan. I had a red beard and I had the robe on because I was invited to go to the mass. <laughs> And I walked in and they said, oh, you're a Franciscan. And I was about to say, and then the bells rang and I wound up in a line and I stood next to John Paul. He was doing the mass. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. So that's what a story. story. It was true. I, I was actually, per now listen, you know this. There are godly Catholic priests. Agreed, yes. Yeah, and so I was prayer partners with one of them, a guy named Giuseppe Peroni. Mm -hmm. And Giuseppe was friends with Archbishop McNeil. And when the Pope came to Edmonton, my, the city I was closest to, I got this invite. I was one of only six Protestant clergy there. And mm -hmm. so let me say this to you about, about Catholicism. Um, there is beauty and despair side by side. Right. Listen, the, I, I, if, if you go to my website, I, I have a video called Three Classic Streams of Faith, and I talk about sacramentalists, I talk about evangelicals, and I talk about charismatics. And what I do in that video is I demonstrate that these three, uh, the, the, the Catholics, uh, Catholic sacramentalists, Orthodox, High Anglicans, you call them Episcopalians in the States, mm -hmm. the groups of people that focus on the material being infused with the divine have beauty because they produce the best artists, the best musicians, the best, some of the best, some of the most beautiful music, some of the most mm -hmm. beautiful artistry comes from the hands of those who belong to sacramental traditions. Mm -hmm. Some of the greatest writing in the history of the earth comes from people like Dostoevsky and Tolstoy who were Eastern Orthodox, uh, and Graham Greene who's a Catholic and so on. C.S. Lewis is an Anglican, one of the greatest Christian writers of, the, of generations. So that's what they do well. Now, dead letter ritual and trouble, oh man, it's there. If you go down the evangelical corner, evangelicals, they just want to think with their head. <laughs> I'll accept the Lord. <laughs> no, right. In the Catholic Church, when you go forward, you go forward to taste. Yeah. It involves the senses. In the, if you're in a Baptist church, you go forward to choose. Okay? Because you And you think, so Billy Graham's the big guy. He had a program called The Hour of Decision. You choose. Now, if you go forward in a, in a, in a charismatic church, you go forward to have the encounter. I had a really funny thing. I did a Lutheran event, which is in the sacramental stream. I did a Baptist event, which is the evangelical stream. And I did a charismatic event in a Pentecostal church. When I, <laughs> when I asked people to come forward for prayer in Lutheran church, they wouldn't come. I said, why would not they come? Because they're used to the communion. I said, well, put the communion there and put a prayer person beside them. And then the whole church came forward, right? And when I went to the Baptist church, I said, well, anybody here want to pray? Nobody came forward. And I said to the Baptist pastor, why aren't they coming up? 
He said, because the only people who come up with those with a sin issue. <laughs> <laughs> they're not gonna, they're not gonna come up unless they're repenting of a sin issue. I said, Oh, okay. So I couldn't fix that. And I went to the Pentecostal church and it was the same lectures, okay, the same ones. I was mm -hmm. teaching the same thing. And so I said, you know, at the end of the service, I'm gonna open up the altar. And then the entire congregation rose up and came to the front, and I couldn't finish my presentation because <laughs> they were looking for the altar. Now, each of those streams has beauty. Right. There's power in material being infused with divine. There is power in choosing. And there is power in the encounter. Yeah. And if you understand Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right. all of our humanity needs to be encompassed Agreed. in each of these aspects of what it means to be a believer. So now, is there pain in each of those traditions? Absolutely. So the issue here, and I can hear the pain in you, and I know this, if you are talking to a millennial crowd, they do not have the time of day for someone who lies to them. Right. They don't have the time of day for someone who's a hypocrite. They don't have the time of day for somebody who dresses nice. They don't care if you're in ripped jeans. In fact, if you don't have ripped jeans, they don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> the New Testament, the Bible, describes mm -hmm. this relationship between suffering and glory. Yeah. And it doesn't try to undercut the fact that we live in a world in which evil exists, where mm -hmm. sin exists, where pain exists, where trouble exists, and sometimes at the highest levels of society. And it tells us not to focus on, on uh, the evil in society, but to fight it. Right. And it actually doesn't even tell us where it came from. I mean, Jesus of Nazareth never once addressed where evil came from. He simply dealt with it. Right. and that's that's how the scripture commands us and so i mean if you're, i know i'm talking to a millennial crowd right. and if you guys are looking for purpose uh, you got a lot you got a big job to do <laughs> you want to you want to take on evil that's a right. big job well, the gospel is about taking on evil it's that's what it's about in right. fact i can say this to you from world war from world history uh it, were it not for catholics during world war ii many people would have died Unnecessary. Yeah. They hid people away from Nazis who were trying to kill them. And the reason they did that was because they believed. And they knew what was good and what was right. And that whole that there's a there's a marvelous book out there called The Great Generation. And it's all about how the sacrifices of that wartime generation. Many of them were Catholics, lots of them were Presbyterians and Baptists and Pentecostals and you name it. Who cares what kind of Christian they were? They stepped into what they knew they needed to do to stop madness from overrunning the planet. And that included many, many, many fine Catholic believers. And oh, by the way, I don't know, I've been shafted by some bad Catholics. <laughs> yeah. I've been blessed by many good ones. Right. Now, I can't tar everybody with the same brush. Right. I have to see whether or not they live what they believe. And some do. Actually, I, th I think for the most part, the grand majority of people who say yes to the claims of Christ do their level best to it, not, not be a hypocrite and try and live their faith. But you're right. I mean, when, they, when these horrible stories come out and you discover that there's been abuse in the name of God at, in, in institutions that were paid for out of people's you know, offerings when they wanted to do something that was godly and right and to pay for the advance of kindness and goodness across the planet. And that has been taken and given to a jerk and then they hide it. You know, I don't think it would have been anywhere near as bad if there if, if one of those bishops had said, we have an abusive priest here. We're going to go to the police now. And we're going to stop this guy from being a jerk. All right. So, I mean, that's reality. If that had happened, I don't know. I don't understand the ecclesiology of the, of the Catholic system. I do know, I really respected John Paul. Yeah. The guy only spoke 25 languages. You know, he, he stared down the Nazis. He had four earned doctoral degrees. And he's the guy who was behind bridging the gap between Catholics and Protestants in what's called Vatican II. John, mm -hmm. John the 23rd was the guy who started it. But in, his, in that day, it was a guy named Carol Wojtyla who became John Paul II. He did the faith and order work in the background. And he actually brokered a deal with the Lutheran churches to say that Luther was correct after all those hundreds and hundreds of years around the things that Luther was trying to say when he tried to reform the church. Anyway, listen, th th this is, <laughs> I was going to talk about healing prayer. <laughs> No, I, I know we we went off to all these different things because I think a lot of kids in my uh, you know kids and people in my crowd you know they haven't been to church ever or they haven't been to church in such a long time they forgot what the heck goes on there uh, so so I think and and they think that you know anybody that's a priest or a reverend or whatever it may be they think it's just so 
out of what they would want to be in life. So that, let me tell you a story with, with a millenn- that involved a millennial. Okay, so here's mm-hmm. here's what happened. So I, I moved from one city to another, and uh, my son was living in Alberta, and I was mm-hmm. living in southern Ontario, so north of Montana and next to Detroit. To, to put that into right. American perspective here. Okay, so so I'm actually really northern Alberta. <laughs> so we got to the Montana uh, border with with Alberta and drove eight hours at sixty mile an hour without stopping to get to that town. Okay, right. city of mm-hmm. million. That's where he was. Anyway, bottom line was uh, we move and uh, he comes here and he has an old car. I gave him my old car and you got to know something. We barely got that thing across the border to get into this side. And that car went the way of all flesh. <laughs> it, it expired in my driveway. Thank, with, thank the Lord we got that car back here. He was moving here because the Alberta economy took a real hit with, uh, with, uh, with, with a big fire there and the oil stuff that happened, et cetera, et cetera. Right. He was going to work there and live there, but Alberta's an oil economy, and that really shattered. And he came the here. The right? Against his better judgment, he was in his he didn't want to do it. But anyway, he he landed a job with a roofing company, and so I thought, okay, that's good. You can work for a while. You can you can get a car now. So we um, we go and look at a car, mm-hmm. and we find out the next day that the roofing company laid off in the winter. He wasn't going to have enough to do it. So we had another old beater. And I thought, okay, I'll give him my car and maybe I can swing a new car because we need one anyway, because the old one's getting kind of rusty. And old. He's not right, right. So here's what happened. I saw an ad in the newspaper and, um, and it was for a two-year lease return over at a dealership on the other side of the city. Mm-hmm. And so as I, as I saw the ad, like Robbie Gunn knows, there's a signal when God's talking to you. He doesn't usually speak English, all right? He doesn't usually, even with an American accent or a Canadian accent, <laughs> whether it's from the South or from the North or from the Ozark, he, he usually speaks by presence. Yeah. And the presence increased when I saw that ad. It's like a velvety smooth assurance of warmth in behind your emotional state. And I thought, I'm supposed to call this. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. So I phoned, and the leadership had just opened. There was one salesperson on the lot. Now, I had served at Spruce Grove Alliance Church. You got that? Remember yeah. the town of Spruce Grove, which is the suburb of Edmonton, right? So I am doing this. And the lady says, I said, listen, my son needs a car. There's a two-year lease return. and It's got a 0% interest rate. I'm wondering if that's still available. And she said, it is. And I said, oh, uh, what do I need? She said, well, tell your son to bring his Ontario driver's license. Mm-hmm. I said, he hasn't got one yet. Right. He just moved here. He's from Alberta. And she said, oh, what part of Alberta? And I, we said, I said, Spruce Grove, and you could hear the silence. And she said, Spruce Grove. I grew up in Spruce Grove. <laughs> Where, what did you do there? I said, I was the pastor of Spruce Grove Alliance Church. You mean that big church on the corner of Century Road? I said, yeah. I said, I lived right behind that church building, and I used to play in that parking lot. Hmm. I said, yeah, that was where I served. I was there for 10 years. She wow. said, I need to meet you. So I drove out to see this lady and we look at this, the two-year lease return. My son's not quite sure. And then we go home, we find out that there's, there's going to be a layoff. And so we had to give him our old car we needed to buy. So I took my wife out there and I just felt this pull to this place. Huh? So <laughs> you're going to listen. I'm not your average pastor. I laugh, right. I tease, I tell silly stories. I speak some Spanish and my son speaks Spanish. Wow. So doesn't see. And so when I want to tease my wife, I talk Spanish to my son. And then my wife just gets all mad. See? <laughs> <laughs> so, That's pretty good. The sales lady was watching us tease each other. And we're trying out all these cars. And my wife has to be the one satisfied because it's going to be her vehicle, you know? So mm-hmm. we tried this and we tried that. There was a 0% deal on this one. And there was a discount on this one. And there was a used car over here. We're trying all these cars and going all these rides. And I, all, all the time, I'm, I'm poking fun at my poor wife. She's, you know... <laughs> But anyway, when the day was done, she said, you're a pastor? I said, yeah. <laughs> she said, you laugh all the time. Right. I don't know pastors who laugh all the time. I said, well, yeah, if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. <laughs> Take your choice. <laughs> right. And so she said, why did you go into the ministry? I said, well, do you really want to know? And I, I, she said, I really do. And this, now this is, a, so I was 17 when this happened. And I told you, my dad got kicked by a horse and lost most of his vision. Yeah. Okay, now, so here's how, here's how I got called to the ministry when I was 19. Sorry, I was 19 years old. I went to bed one night, and I saw my dad standing by the fridge in the kitchen. I said, Dad, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. All my marks are the same. And he said, oh, son, have a good sleep. You'll know in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, 
So the next day, went to bed and I got up and I knew it was going to be a pastor. I just right. knew. So I went to the school. I saw a guidance counselor. He got me an appointment. Mm -hmm. And within, within one week, I saw three of the committees that were attached to this. And I was through what usually takes two years. It was done in one week. Wow. And at the end of the week, my dad said, hey, son, whatever happened with, with your desire to go find some job? And I said, dad, I, I figured it out. And I woke up the next day and I knew. I said, what was that? He said, well, I'm going to be a pastor. And his jaw dropped. He turned white as a sheet. And he began to physically shake. Wow. And so I'm telling this to this millennial in this car who's selling me this car. And, and she said, well, why did he shake? I said, well, he wouldn't tell me at first. He said he had to have a shot of whiskey. So, <laughs> so, so my, my dad said, when work is done, we got to talk. We ran a restaurant. So the restaurant was closed and it's after hours. And he takes a shot of whiskey, he has a shot and he calms down. And then he said, I went to bed that night. The risen Lord appeared to me and stood me up in my bedroom and said, go and wake your son, David, and ask him what he's dreaming. Then tell him he's going to be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so my dad didn't tell me this. So he races upstairs and he tries to, I have two brothers. Uh, we're all three sleeping in the same room. He tries to wake me and I don't wake up. And so he says to himself, that was the craziest dream I ever had in my entire life, you know? And, and by the way, at that moment, my dad was an agnostic because of all the tr all the right. that had happened on, to his life. He lost most of his eyesight. He'd been treated poorly. But so he goes back down to bed. He gets himself in the bed and the Lord reappears to him, mm -hmm. walks over to him, stands him to his feet and says, you did not wake him. Go and wake him. My dad said, go away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. Well, so then he yeah. said, you have to wake him, ask him what he dreams. The dream is fading. Go now. And so my dad went upstairs, apparently shook me awake. I don't remember it, but I remember wow. saying, to, uh, my dad told me this years later, after I started training for the ministry, he mm -hmm. said uh, I, that I said, I didn't know what uh, I had, what I dreamt. And he said, I was, I, the Lord told me I was to tell you, you are going into the ministry. You're going to travel the earth. You're going to write books. You're going to travel across the United States and Canada and Europe and Asia. You're going to go there. You're going to teach people all over the planet. And then I went to, I woke up the next day and, I went and I had all these hoops were jumped through in two weeks and it only takes two years, you know, a week, week and a half. So, I mean, this amazing thing happened. And so this lady, this millennial in the car, <laughs> she said, do you mean Jesus of Nazareth appeared to your dad in a dream when he didn't believe? I said, yeah. He said, could you tell me more about that? <laughs> <laughs> so we bought the car and I had to go back for an oil change every three months because they gave me 12 free oil changes. See, Every time I saw her, she would run across the room and say, I got to hear about your faith. Tell me more about this. And so eventually there was this crazy moment. I was walking in my church and there were these cards to invite people to a, some, a program called Alpha. All right. Mm -hmm. Alpha is where you explain the faith to anybody who's seeking over a meal. Right. And I saw that card sitting on top of the desk and I said, ah, this is not a good day to go for the oil change, but I won't get there and I'll lose the opportunity to get my free oil change unless I go now. So I grabbed my computer and I took a card and then the spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, take another. So I took another card. And then the spirit of the Lord said, take five. Mm -hmm. There was only five cards left. I grabbed all five. I shoved them in my pocket. I drove across the city to get my oil change. The girl races over to me and she said, I can't stand it. I can't wait three months to talk to you about your faith. Uh, get, it, it, I said, well, how about coming out Sunday night for a meal and you can listen and we can talk. She said, I'm in, I'm in. So give me an invite. So I give her a card. She said, I want another one for my husband. My husband needs to come. So I gave it to him. And so she said, look, I got three friends. Give me five cards. So I took the five cards that I'd found on the desk. And, <laughs> and then she and her husband came and she'd invited three friends who didn't come. But in the middle of that, yeah, in the middle of that, she got injured at work mm. and she was unable to walk with, with, with a brace, unless she had a brace on her leg. And there was a session where we talked about Jesus as the healer. And she was at my table. And uh, the husband was, uh, was a nominal Catholic, someone just like you. He'd had a grandfather who left the ministry because he wanted to get married and he was kicked out of the church. He was excommunicated. And so there was this kind of nasty attitude toward Catholics, but he had a nominal Catholic faith. And so he'd been burned by all things Catholic. And this girl had you no know, faith. And so we were together in this thing. Mm -hmm. And here's what happened. She, she uh, 
the, the guy talks about the power of Jesus to heal. And the same thing happened inside of me. I got this fire going inside of me. I had a picture pop into my head of me praying for her so that her leg would become better. And I said, would you allow me to pray for you? And mm -hmm. she said, <laughs> she, she covered her hands with her head, you know, and, and then, and then she said, oh, okay, if you feel you're supposed to. And so I said, in the name of Jesus, walk. And she, her husband said, don't do that. You get down on the ground. If you can lift your leg, that's Jesus healing you. So she got down on the ground and I prayed for her and I felt this fire go into her and she lifted her leg. And there were 25 witnesses in the room. Yeah. And so here's what happened. Both of them had no connection with the faith. None. Except this bad experience of being burned by the Catholic Church. Right. And we saw the reality yeah. of the power of God touching her physical body. Oh. I baptized both of them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, those are, those are really good stories. Listen, watch out for those fire-reading dragons. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to...